Divine Truth Theme Discussions Discussions between Jesus and Mary about specific topics and issues. This is session 15, part 5 of the discussion God's Laws of Forgiveness and Repentance, where Jesus and Mary continue to discuss God's principles and laws of forgiveness and repentance, focusing this session on the feelings, emotions, and responses God has generally has towards sin itself, and has when his children choose to sincerely forgive and repent. This session was recorded on the 5th of June 2018 from 10.30 a.m. in Wilsdale, Queensland, Australia. How God feels about my desire to forgive and repent. So obviously we've been talking a lot about how God feels about various things. Mm. but we're within this series about forgiveness and repentance. Uh, so it's this is what we're really getting down to. Mm. And obviously most of us, and hopefully our viewers will have realised by now, most of us are pretty blocked to forgiveness and repentance. Yes, you, you could almost say that most of us are blocked to, firstly, even the laws of compensation. Most yeah. of us are blocked to you know, the way the conscience operates. And most of us are blocked to actually going through the process of forgiveness and repentance. Yeah. So. You know, obviously, a lot of what we've already covered, most of us are blocked to. Yes. So, bearing in mind that we're blocked to those <laughs> particular things, it is valid to discuss God's emotions about it and, and at least present um, to people who are listening, even though they could connect to the conscience and find out quite easily mm-hmm. what God feels about you when you forgive or when you repent. It, it, it's valid to actually now have a bit of a discussion about how God feels. Yeah. And and this was always has always been the case. And you know, right in the first century, frequently I tried to attempt through the use of illustrations to help people understand how God felt about them personally and also how God felt about a person who was repentant. Yeah. And so, you know, it's valid for us to have these particular conversations to encourage people to start to engage the processes involved in forgiveness and repentance. Yeah, mm. yeah, mm. absolutely. So... Um, We want to, we're going to um, break this into sections, but we really want to find out how God feels about us when we're refusing to forgive and repent, don't Mm -hmm, we? mm -hmm. Um, And then the opposite, how God feels when we actually want to engage with that process. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, you know, obviously, you know, God has, as we've established already in the first two thirds of this conversation, it's obvious that God has feelings about sin, mm-hmm. and it's also have, it's obvious that God has emotions and feelings about, you know, about humans generally and what we choose to do. So, so, so when we come to forgiveness and repentance, th- that is a choice we're making. Yeah. So, so this is a, and what does God feel about this choice? Is it a very important choice to God that you make a choice to forgive or repent? Or is it just something that God feels is not very important? What mm-hmm. what is the feelings mm-hmm. that what are the feelings that God actually has? Mm. But but also um, specifically the feelings God has about forgiveness and repentance and why He has those particular feelings about yeah. forgiveness and repentance. And and you can already see from the conversation leading up to now yeah. that that obviously given God's uh, like quite strong dislike of sin. Mm-hmm. Um, you could say that obviously a person who starts to engage forgiveness and repentance really takes, you know, it's something God notices yeah. and, and something that God is keenly observing and also keenly interested in a person engaging that process in comparison to a person who just engages the process of the law of compensation, mm. which, which is basically a refusal to yeah. forgive and repent. <laughs> so mm. they're sort of being forced into changes in their will uh, rather than through actually the law, yeah. through the law. Through the law. Like God's not forcing them, but the law itself, yeah. the, the pain and suffering involved in the law causes a person to pause mm-hmm. and to maybe consider some alternative. Eventually. Eventually, yeah. you know, to consider some alternative behaviour. But, uh, you know, obviously when it comes to forgiveness and repentance, we're talking here and, we, and we've said all the way along that this is a voluntary desire that mm-hmm. has to be engaged from within the person heart, as a heartfelt, sincere desire. Mm. So obviously that is very, very different than just letting the law of compensation grind away at you all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. <laughs> all right. Let's get on with it. Mm. God does not force me to forgive and repent. So this is the first point that we want to discuss. Um, obviously, 
we've really already explained in the course of this series and even in our discussion today that God's never forcing us towards anything. Mm. Uh, the laws operate to bring about change, mm. um, but there's never there's never a forcing such as some of us kind of experienced in our childhood where we were, you know, told we had to forgive something or that we mm. should be sorry about something. Mm. Uh, God's never like that. Is no, he? no. So why doesn't God force us to forgive and repent? Well, firstly, let's look at the processes of forgiveness and repent. In repentance, they both must be voluntarily engaged. Mm. So, so obviously, anybody who's forced to do something that should be voluntary yeah. is obviously, it's no longer voluntary. So, yeah. so now that it's not voluntary, you could say that uh, it's now no longer those particular processes. Because so. we've <laughs> said, haven't we, that... We could call our condition or our will as the state that we're currently in, mm -hmm. and it's sort of driving us. It almost feels unconsciously we're just acting in our injured state all of the time. I'm oh, sorry, you don't like that word. No, I'm no, just, I see. Yeah. See, I, yeah, I find it difficult when people say that to me. You know, they regurgitate divine truth teachings back to me, and I go, "Hey, so that's yeah. not what I'm saying." <laughs> and so, so let's look at it truly, though. The, as we've already established, the engagement of sin is driven by, not just driven by will, but it's also driven by desire. And this is something yes. that, the, that anyone who comes to be the next group of assistance groups will learn pretty, pretty you yeah. know, we'd be focusing our attention yeah. on those things. So will, let's call will our current condition. Yes. So yes, certainly our current condition does have an impact upon, you know, what we choose to do. But, yes. But, but, but. We can also choose to do something completely the opposite of our current condition, uh, whether in a good way or a bad way. So, so, so the reality is desire has also a very large impact, not just our will. Yes, I, and I wasn't referring to sin as much as the processes of forgiveness and repentance. So yeah. they are always based on a desire to change our current state. Yes, aren't they? so that's not so about that's, your will. It's not about your will. That's yeah. about desire. That's right. And that inherent in desire is this voluntary engagement yes. in a new process, in yep. a desire to change something about right. ourselves. And in the yeah. past, in, in, we've talked about will and desire as one thing. Mm. But as we learnt in the 2016 assistance groups, in the third uh, group particularly, yeah. we, we are trying to help people understand now there's two portions to your will. There's yeah. the there's your current condition, yes. which determines certain things. Yeah. And then there's also what are your desire for your future condition? Yeah. What's your faith about your future mm. condition? And that has a large impact upon what you choose to do. So, mm -hmm. so here we're basically saying, well, firstly, God can't f force us to forgive or repent because, because to force us would mean that we'd no longer be voluntarily or doing it by desire. Yeah. And, and because forgiveness and repentance is only a desire-based process, mm -hmm. it, 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 it then makes sense that if somebody forces you to forgive or repent, then you're not forgiven, yeah. for, <laughs> forgiving or repentant. Yes. <laughs> so, and, and maybe a good, a good thing to there is to use an illustration uh, about that. And, mm -hmm. and this, this illustration is about a parent who asks a child to say sorry when the child has done what the parent believes is something wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, any parent who does this is automatically acting against the laws of love of God. Yeah. Right. So and and you see this happening on every time you're with parents. You, you say sorry for this or you say sorry for that and, mm -hmm. and so forth. And does a child feel sorry? No, a child does not feel sorry. It is not voluntarily <laughs> saying sorry. And it also has no intention of correcting yeah. either its behaviour or the effects of its behaviour. It's, it's interesting, <laughs> isn't it? Because very often in those moments when we're told we should say sorry, there's a different feeling that comes up. It might be shame or guilt for the child. And this is how, as adults, we get very confused about what repentance is. That's right. We start to feel like guilt and shame. That is me repenting because as a child, those things were associated with when we said sorry. That's right. Um, so we're never really or very rarely is a child encouraged to actually feel what a sorry feeling feels like. And not only that, you know, full repentance involves a number of other steps, as yes. we've already discussed. And yes. one of those steps, obviously, is a correction of yeah. what you chose to do wrong. What, what? And also a correction of the cause of why you chose to do this thing wrong. Yeah. And, and obviously, a person who's just forcing you to say sorry has no intention and has probably no idea yes. what what drove you to do those particular things yeah. and also has often no intention or no idea of how to correct it now the damage has been done yeah. so yeah. yeah so yeah. so you can see quite clearly that even the act 
you, you know, God's not like a parent on earth who says, you say sorry, you know, yeah. <laughs> because at the end of the day, God knows that if he has to say that to you, already you're not sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a person who's truly sorry, it comes from their heart. You know, it doesn't, yeah. it's not something that um, has to be encouraged yes. or forced. So, and it's interesting, isn't it, that all of God's laws are, as we've learned in this series, they're attempting to help us to see those two factors, the effects of what we did mm. and the cause within us of why we did it mm. or why we justified doing it. Uh, yeah, and, and not only with both of those things, the, the effects, you could say, are broken into, into a number of different areas, aren't they? Because mm -hmm. there's the effects that it has upon us, mm -hmm. which often we're not sensitive to at all, because we're in our addiction, we think we're getting a good thing. Yeah. Right? And then, and then there's also the effect it has on others yep. and our environment and so yep. forth. And, and obviously, you know, God's measuring these particular things. And then there's this uh, third or, you know, the, these other uh, avenues of like when we do something that's a sin in how much work it creates for other people, yes. not, not just not just the damage it does to other people, but how much work it creates for them, what, mm. what they have to do mm. to overcome your sin yeah. like in terms of if they if and particularly if they are good good people or mm -hmm. you know people if, who if care they don't want to sin yeah, yeah. and also just uh, attempting to help the people that you've harmed you know yeah. that, that there's you know there's people that you harm through mm. your sin and then there's a group of people who need to help those people who mm. have been harmed because now they do need some assistance to see that you've sinned and it's not their problem right yeah. and so there's all this extra work that's carried on as well and a person who is truly repentant for example mm. uh, understands all that yes all that extra work that has been uh, you know involved in f fixing this particular problem and so forth so they want to understand firstly and mm. then of course because they want to then they come to to understand and mm. they want to face all of that emotionally as well that's right so it, it's interesting that God, all of god's laws are really attempting to show us all of that even before we desire to engage repentance so yeah. it'd be great if parents on earth instead of saying say sorry for <laughs> and i'll your give you a melting if you say yeah, sorry yeah. The, threat, the threat of violence which is very similar to how the christian religion sees god really yeah, yeah. the threat of violence if i don't you know if i'm yeah. not sorry you know that yeah. kind of thing yeah mm. But it would be far better to say, hey, what happened? Why did you? Why did that happen? Why did you do it? And let's look at the effects of what happened. Uh, what, what I to, yeah, what I used way. to do with my boys uh, is uh, used to sit them down. Uh, they used to hate it, actually. <laughs> they but, preferred the violence, <laughs> They preferred reckon. the violence, really. But, uh, but uh, they, we used to sit down and I used to discuss with them how they felt about what they did and, mm. what, and did they feel about, you know, how the other person felt about what they did and mm. so forth. And... And after a while in the discussion, they would start feeling like, wow, you know, it did affect other people and this is how I felt. Mm -hmm. And even though at the time I didn't understand the, how to address the causes of that, yeah. uh, which so I would have gone further if, mm -hmm. I, if I knew that. But uh, at least y if you do that, y y whatever then comes from the child in terms of their actions is coming from them and not from you. Yes. Whereas, whereas if you just say, you know, say sorry or else I'll punish you, yeah. obviously the child's going to say sorry to, to avoid punishment if you can. Yeah. Uh, but how, what benefit is that? Yeah. And it has no benefit really to the child or to the person he's saying sorry to. Yeah. And he certainly has no intention of fixing anything. Yeah. So. So you can see a voluntary action is very, very important here. Yes. And, and it's very important for our listeners to understand that yeah. if, if, if repentance and forgiveness is not voluntarily engaged, mm -hmm. then, then obviously it's not repentance and forgiveness anymore. Yes. Mm. So that's the first thing. Mm. It must be voluntarily engaged. Mm. Second thing we've already touched on, haven't we, which surrounds not only this voluntary engagement, mm -hmm. but also there has to be uh, the motivation to correct and change what unloving thing inside of me I justified in order to yeah, well, sin. Look, yeah, well, let's look at it. There's probably three or four things that need to be corrected and changed, isn't yes. there? There's firstly the, uh, the effects of the action itself. So the external and internal effects of my sin. Yeah, well, let's, yeah. Uh, dis yeah, let's separate them yep. because there's the it's external effects of what I did. Okay. So so usually I engage in an addiction, which is then remember the desire. Yep for you know the sin yeah and the addiction force for, forces me now because i've got this desire forces me into sin mm -hmm. so so now so when i say forces it it, it drives me it's like a frenzy mm -hmm. into sin so now that i've got the addiction i i engage this desire i sin mm -hmm. that sin has an effect on my environment 
Yeah. Not uh, just forget about us for the moment. Yes. It has an effect on our environment. Mm -hmm. Are we prepared to undo the effect it had on our mm -hmm. environment? You know, that's an interesting question because because mm. for most people, they're not prepared to do that at all. And, you know, I see this happening all the time, you know, um, you know, even just with the eating meat issue, which yes. is a very basic sort of an issue of love. And um, how many people on this planet are actually undoing the damage to the environment that they cause by eating meat? Mm. You know, like virtually no one, even those people who have become vegans are still not spending time undoing the damage, yeah. like actually doing all this work on their land to fix it all, all mm -hmm. up and all the damage that's been done. It's a very rare thing to, yeah. for, because, because to do it requires a lot of energy, time, effort and money. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to do all that, right? Yeah. So, so you're so, saying even some people who decide I'm going to seize that sin, they st they, they're they looking to the future. I don't want to continue to harm, but I'm not great. looking backwards. That's good, but yeah. I'm not looking backwards to remedy the harm I've already no, done. No, yeah. and there's very little intention, in fact, of anybody who changes to remedy the harm that's already done. Yeah. And and, and this is a big problem, right? Yeah. So so a person who's truly repentant um, would want to do that. Yes. They'd want to uh, look at the harm they've already done and try to reverse that harm. Yeah. And even amongst the opposition they may get to reverse that harm. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people like you in addiction and they like mm -hmm. your addiction because then they can have their addictions and yeah. so forth. There's these interactions in addiction, uh, codependent interactions. And when you stop your addictions, mm -hmm. acting, acting upon your addictions, people around you are often quite dissatisfied with you. Yes. And they often get angry with you and everything, you yeah. know. So... So are you prepared for all of that? Are mm. you going to do that? That's an interesting question in itself. Then there's the internal effect it's had on you, the effect it's had on you, mm. which, it, which is the law of compensation damage to your own soul. Are you willing to feel that? Yeah. Then there's the cause of what you did, which is your addiction. Mm. Are you willing to address that cause? Yes. Now, if you're not voluntarily and desirous of doing those things, then, then you're not engaging repentance and forgiveness mm. now. You're just engaging the law of compensation. Yeah. Yeah. And also, if you complain about that process and you're sort of suggesting that that process is... It's hard for you or... Yeah, really hard and terrible and traumatic and... As if that's worse than what you did. Yes. Right? And the reality is what you did is far worse than the recovery of what you did. Mm. So if you say that, you know, you, you know, oh, how hard it is now that I've got to go through all of that, you're not sorry or repentant. You're just having a tantrum about what you've now got to do to mm -hmm. fix up what you've done. Mm -hmm. And and so a lot of people don't understand that, you know, they say, oh, yes, I've, you know, I've forgiven this person, but this is how I feel, or I've, I've repent, but, but this is, I still feel this way and that way. Then there's no repentance really. Yes. Uh, a, foot, a person who's truly repentant does these things de with desire. Yes. You know, they want to do those their things. Heart, their heart feeling is this is important to me. I mm. actually want to engage with this. That's right. So you've mentioned there, was that four things? So first, I want to look at the external effects and they could be my environment, the people around me. Yeah, well, the, the most important thing is the people around you, yep. of course, because the way God sees the human is, is far higher than he sees every other creation. So, yes. you know, obviously God's first looking at what have you done to harm other people mm -hmm. here. So that's number one. And then of course there's the environment mm -hmm. and and what are you doing what are you doing to undo what you did to these yes. particular people and, and to the environment itself mm -hmm. and then there's the, the the third thing was this this uh, what happened to you with the law of compensation are you willing to feel and be sensitive to how you damaged your own soul yes and then there's are you willing to get to the base cause of the addiction mm. to cure this particular problem for good? Mm -hmm. So, so, so that you never feel a desire to engage it ever again. Yeah. So, so obviously, if we're not voluntarily and with desire engaging those particular things, and we have to be told that we need to do those particular things, then we're not really, uh, you know, we're not even in a state of awareness of mm. our sin at this point. Mm. You know, mm. to get into a state of awareness of sin. There needs to be uh, a point where you see the results of your sin, the effects of it, the effects of it on other people, the effects of it on the environment, the mm -hmm. effects of it on yourself, and you're willing to feel those particular things and correct them, mm -hmm. which is of particular importance, mm -hmm. and correcting them. Mm -hmm. And you're willing to go to the cause of the reason why you did it and actually correct that. And so, you know, unless, unless you're doing all those things, then there's no sincere desire for personal adjustment. <laughs> and yeah. if there's no sincere desire for personal adjustment, then you're not in a state of forgiveness and repentance. You're just in a state of the law of conversation, grinding away at mm. your condition.
So when you describe all of that, it sounds like it's going to take a long time when in fact this this is more efficient than than any other process, isn't it? Of course, yeah. And it does not take a long time when you're sincere. Mm. And it particularly does not take a long time when you've got a conscience working. Mm. Because it, because all you've got to do is ask God, what, what, what is the harm I did to them? And God will tell you if you're open to receiving that. Yeah. Right, so, so maybe, again, if I give an illustration of that, let's say a person commits a sin, but they don't see that they've done anything wrong at all from God's perspective. They don't see, you know, how it's affected other people. They don't see what they need to do to correct it. They don't see what, it, you know, is inside of themselves that actually caused the problem in the first place. And they don't want to know what is inside of them that caused it. And they don't want to feel the effects of their sin through the, that's already happening through the law of conversation then how aware are they of their sin? Mm. You, you, can't, you can't say they're aware of sin at mm. all. You, there is a complete lack of awareness of sin under those circumstances. So, so most of the people that we meet who come to our groups and so forth at this stage have a complete lack of awareness of their sin at this stage. And what we're trying to do is help them mm. go through this process, through, you know, through these series of presentations. Yes. What we're trying to do is help them go through this process of being able to recognize a sin, being able to hear from God why it is, being able to hear from God what damage they did, mm. being able to hear from God what the reason was inside of themselves as to why they chose to do it, mm. and also developing a real desire in, from them from themselves to actually correct it. Mm. Now, that requires a large degree of sincerity, but it doesn't have to take a long time. Yeah. But, but it does require a huge attitude shift. Yes. Because it you're, ex- you're describing a very emotional and personal process. It's very different to you saying to me verbally, Mary, your propensity mm. for anger whenever you're stressed is a sin, mm. for example. Mm. And me saying, yeah, I can see there's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> and me saying, oh, that's me recognising my sin. It's n- that's nothing like the process you just described no and yet that process you described that having sensitivity to the cause and the effects and all of that that's what you're saying is required before i will actually well it's part of the desire to repent it is yeah wanting that sensitivity is part of the desire to repent yes so when when we uh do our presentations in the assistance groups about removing sin and its causes we're obviously going to focus our attention on those particular things that need to happen. Yeah. Because, uh, because it, you know, it's one thing, it, you sort of have to go through the process of first understanding sin and where it come from and what, what, what caused it, right? Mm-hmm. But, but even at that point, we're not demonstrating a desire yet to move it, yes. to shift it, to get yeah. rid of it and to get rid of its cause, you know? Mm. And, and so, you know, a person who's truly who truly desires repentance and forgiveness is willing and desires to find the cause mm. and go through the pro- this process, which involves also correcting the results of the sin mm. as well, as much as they're able. Mm. Because that, as we did mention in this series, you, you can see that there's many sins that we may commit that we may never able be, be able yeah. to personally repair, given forever to repair it. Yes. Only God and God's laws will be able to repair it in the long run mm. uh, because, of it, because of a number of factors. And, and, you know, but we can still do our best yeah. to repair it. And that's what God measures. So you've been speaking a lot now about repentance. If you were co- to contrast or uh, um, draw a similarity with that sensitivity that must be developed when it comes to forgiveness, could you do that briefly? Yes, yeah, so I feel like with forgiveness, it's almost the same kind of process because a refusal to forgive is something you have to repent for. <laughs> yeah, it's a sin in itself. <laughs> it's a sin in itself. Yeah. And, and, there, and there's good reasons why that is the case because God knows is if you refuse to forgive, then you retain rage and anger inside of you that is justified. Mm. There's your addiction. Mm. And, and, and if you engage that addiction, it's highly likely you're going to do a whole series of damaging things to other people as a result of that rage and anger that exists inside of you. Yeah. So, so what you've got to do is go through the process of forgiveness in a very similar way. Mm-hmm. And forgiveness, forgiveness, a proper process of forgiveness also looks at, okay, when I refuse to forgive, what is the, are the effects of that? Yeah. How, how does that damage other people? How does that damage me? How is that damaging my life? What, what effects is it having on my life? 
what what is the pain inside that I'm masking by the refusal to forgive? Yeah. Uh, and what is the underlying addiction I have, which is mm. the rage and anger or the, mm. the, the resistive feeling that I have towards forgiveness? Mm. That is the thing that's causing me to do all of those things. So why aren't I willing to feel that? There must yes. be some pain there yeah. that I'm not willing to feel. So it's very similar a process it in is. some ways. Yeah. Um, did you mention also, I have to develop the sensitivity to say, I have to forgive you for something. Thing. I have to develop a sensitivity to your sin, uh, to what was sinful towards me as well, don't I? Yes, and as we were discussed in our first three or four sessions of yeah. this session, that's a very hard process because we've yeah. got a very high distortion of what is really a sin against us and what yeah. isn't. You know, for some people, just telling another person the truth is a sin. You mm. know, so mm. so. You know, obviously, we've got very high distortions there. So the the key with that, with forgiveness is about finding God's truth, truth. on the matter. Yeah, and, and this is where the conscience is so This is where so the conscience helpful. is so important. Yeah. Because uh, cause without God's truth on the matter, you are not going to be able to recognise what you need to forgive. Yeah. You're going to think other people are harming you when they are not. Yes. And you're going to think they're not harming you when they are. Yes. Right? Unless you have God's viewpoint of the matter. Mm. So, so, for example, if you have a codependent addiction with another person, you expect them to, you know, to meet their addiction mm. in order to meet your addiction, right? Mm. So codependent addictions are about a person engaging one of their addictions yes. to give something to you so that you've received that and feel good. And then you and feel And then your addiction is give, met. And yes. then you might, uh, you know, meet, in, one, of their meet one of theirs in, yep. in payment, if yep. you like, for that. Now, a, a person in that kind of a relationship believes themselves usually to be in a very, very good relationship and a nice friendship and so forth, while yeah. from God's perspective, the whole thing is corrupt, <laughs> yeah. right? Literally corrupt and evil from God's perspective. So, And if one person break, <clears throat> jiggles up that codependence, very often the other will say, well, now you're harming me and you're sinning and it's <laughs> exactly. all a big drama. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That, yeah. When you take away the codependence, that's when they think you're sinning. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when, you know, they're, you know, obviously it becomes an inflammatory problem for them and, and, and eventually maybe even a violent one, you yeah. know, so, so, or an abusive one. So, mm. so at the end of the day, we've got to see, well, no, remember, we've said right from the beginning that this is how God measures a sin, yeah. not how humans measure a sin. Yeah. Frequently, humans measure codependent addiction as a good thing. Yes. And when you are not engaged in codependent addiction, they view that as a sin, yeah. which is completely the opposite of how God sees it. So, so really, you're saying even in the process of forgiveness, we have to have some personal fortitude, personal integrity, personal um, really... Uh, uh, alliance or loyalty with God's truth on the matter. Yeah, it's about ethics, really. About isn't it? ethics, mm. because externally we may actually, uh, well, we often do cop a lot of attack for wanting to forgive. It's, it's we had a conversation in private with someone the other day, and you were saying uh, you were talking to them about something, but we were reflecting that a lot of your life you were trying to validate pain inside of people or, or injury inside of people that they wish to deny while simultaneously they would like you to validate sin and error and injury with them within them that you have to deny and and so it becomes yeah yes. there's two points of anger basically one yes. point of anger is when you're trying to help another person connect to their pain and they don't, and want, they don't want to yeah and the other point of anger that the person has as well is they want you to meet their pleasure their their addictions their pleasures yes or say so this is valid uh, good thing yeah, about me that is yeah. a good thing yeah and you can't yeah and so they get they're angry in both directions yes. you know and, and i've frequently found that when when i've realized within myself that i needed to change something and so i have I've frequently found that those around me get angry with me on both of those fronts. Yes. They don't like the fact that I've changed. Yes. Uh, that I know that I'm now, you know, exposing the pain that's within them. Mm -hmm. And they also don't like the fact that I now won't meet their demand for pleasure, you know, yes. their, their addictive demand for pleasure. Yes. So, so in both cases, they're now angry, you yeah. know, whereas before they were quite okay with yes. me. You know? so, <laughs> so, you know, sometimes it does appear when you do it God's way, sometimes mm. It does appear to people on earth that you're actually regressing <laughs> when, when nothing could be further from the truth, yeah, really. You know? Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. All right. Mm. So uh, this is, we uh, remembering we're talking about why God doesn't force the process of forgiveness and yes. repentance. So 
it's because it's very much as you keep highlighting this got to be a desire based process within the person on a lot of it with regard to a lot of factors that's right Mm -hmm. yes um the third thing the third major thing or another major thing you wanted to mention here was that god these forgiveness and repentance laws are separate from the laws that are automatically operating when we're not engaging with the desire so this compensatory uh process is already happening isn't it so if yeah so so you could say that the compensation the laws of compensation are already uh forcing the person to come to some point of recognition at some point in their future yeah uh, so god doesn't need to take any force yeah <laughs> and, and certainly can't with the repentance of forgiveness because that's a different process that's voluntary yes. but when it comes to the law of compensation obviously the law itself it's like any law. It's like the law of gravity. You jump off a building, it's going to pull you to the ground. If you jump off a too high building, it's going to pull you to the ground quite rapidly. And, yeah. and with an accelerating force, it's going to end up, you know, hurting you. Yes. So, so it's very similar to the other laws of God. They operate uh, without any, you know, pre- preference or, 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 you know, and they're permanent, they're yeah. constant. They, and the, the the laws of compensation are exactly the same. They mm. they, they are no they do not respect who you are. Yeah, they, they're not they're a respecter of person. No, they they are, uh, they are they are equal in the way they operate. And and so you know it's like any law. You, you're not going to be able to complain about. It. At the end of the day, it's been created for your safety actually. Yeah. So the law of compensation is actually been the basic reason why God created it is for your own safety. So you can't actually physic physically destroy your own soul. Yeah. That that's why the why God created the law, mm. and so so it's a it's a law to prevent you from going too far, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and actually exceed your design criteria. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah. So so the law of compensation is working naturally. So so since the law of compensation is working naturally, there's no need for God to take any forceful action, mm. uh, uh, and certainly no violent punishing action, mm. which is what you know most religious things who people who believe in a one god type of belief or you know in in a personal god type of belief Mm -hmm. most of them think that god is like a punishing wrathful god but there's no need for god to Mm. to do all of that his laws look after everything Mm. and and so god's already god god's already got everything in process to correct you it's just whether you're going to be voluntary with it or not whether you are going to want to be corrected or not so you're basically saying God's laws, regardless of our will and desire, mm-hmm. keep ensure that there can't be anarchy and keep thing keep love as the um, governing force. Correct. So even when we rebel against even it. Even when we rebel, there's all these other laws mm. and processes we've discussed. Yeah. So there's no need for God to force us into repentance and forgiveness because it's all sorted. It's just whether or not we want to give the gift and have the personal benefit um, of this, uh, these higher laws. Mm. And so that's why it's never forced. That's right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Very so good. when we come to the fourth reason, um, when we think about the higher laws versus these lower laws, like if you, if you compare the law of compensation, which we did in sessions four to eight of this series, mm-hmm. if you compare the law of compensa- compensation with the laws pertaining to forgiveness and repentance, mm-hmm. you can see quite clearly that the law of compensation is a lower law in that it's operational like the law of gravity. It, it, it's a moral law operating mm-hmm. like the law of gravity works upon the physical yes. side of life. Yep. And, and in the sense that you can't sort of, uh, you can't go lower than it. It's the, yep. it's the lowest law that operates trying to cause change within the human soul Mm -hmm. and to try and to correct the human soul from its sinful deeds. Now, now the higher laws are very very different to that. To to engage them, you've got to know them. Mm -hmm. You've got to understand them. You've got to believe in them. You've got to have faith in them. And you've also got to know how they work. You've got to understand how Mm -hmm. they work. Now, that all requires education and knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, So if a person is unwilling or has never been educated or, or, or found any knowledge about these particular laws, the higher yep. laws, it's highly unlikely that they'll fully engage those higher laws to a complete degree, which would complete the forgiveness and repentance processes. Mm-hmm. So most people on earth begin a, who begin a repentance or forgiveness process 
never completed on earth mm. because they have not been educated about how to complete it. Yep. And, and how to complete it involves these other aspects that we've been talking about, the aspects of seeing the sin, the results of the sin, the damaging results to other people, the environment, even the damaging results of forcing other people who are loving mm. to work for you, to work against mm -hmm. your sin and mm -hmm. all these kind of damaging effects that your sin has. Yep. When when you fully understand why all of that's in operation, now you can fully grasp what repentance is going to be all about. Yes. So, so it's only through this sort of getting education that a higher law can be engaged. Mm -hmm. How do we get education? Well, again, that is dependent upon our desire to mm -hmm. be educated. Yeah. So, so the reason why on earth there's very little education available mm -hmm. about the laws of repentance and forgiveness is because very few people on earth want to receive an education mm. about the laws of forgiveness and repentance. And obviously here you and I are providing like educational material about this yeah, process. Yes, so, and I'd say the last 15 sessions is rudimentary information mm -hmm. uh, involved to help people understand the, how, how the laws work, how, you know, the emotional content of the laws, how they operate, how, how the conscience and the law of conversation is involved and the voluntary aspects of the laws mm. of forgiveness and repentance. It's all been, all been constructed in such a way to provide as much like what we feel is essential sort of rudimentary information to get started in actually going through the processes of forgiving and repenting. So does everyone need this series to, be, to get the education though? Or is... Yeah, I feel so because right. the, the average concept of pe oh, from people on earth uh, about forgiveness and repentance doesn't involve the conscience, mm -hmm. doesn't involve an understanding of the law of compensation, mm -hmm. doesn't involve an understanding of it being a, a, an emotional process, mm -hmm. doesn't uh, involve uh, understand how God is involved in mm -hmm. the, particularly in the process of repentance, right, in, in, mm -hmm. ter in, in terms of uh, helping us, but also in both processes. And so, you know, while people on earth, pro some people do enter a state of forgiving, and some of them quite naturally so. Yes. Right. And some people do enter a state of repentance and some quite naturally so. Yeah. It's rare for a person to complete it. And yeah. that's why no person on this planet, aside from myself in the first century, ever passed in an one condition mm. with God because mm. they never completed the processes. Mm. Once you complete the processes of forgiveness and repentance, you will be at one with God. Mm. Uh, and you will also believe in God, yeah. by the way because the process of repentance requires such a thing. A connection with God, yeah. Exactly. So then are you saying, um, it, it, like it seems to me that if I even just engage with my conscience mm -hmm. uh, or the conscience mechanism, that I could begin to get the education that we are verbally talking about here. Yes. So it's not all contingent on a video series of, of from us. This is obviously a massive gift because we are putting into words these things, but but it's still not this. It's still not the full education that a person that you're referring to in this point is it? Because that education has to be soul based. Well, of course it has to be soul based, yeah. but the you know the the real education like how how do we know these things yeah through connection with the conscience and through connection with god through the holy spirit correct yeah that's how we know so 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 unless a person does those two things yeah. they're, they're not going to be able to fully engage these processes that, yes. that's the reality yeah and and there you know that's an, just another benefit of having a relationship with god mm. that you can you can engage these higher laws that hardly anybody on earth really knows anything about yeah. and and you can engage these higher laws with with desire and passion mm -hmm. because you have confidence in the fact that they work and that you know that they work and and the and you know that because your conscience it goes yeah. through the conscience is telling you yeah. no this is what uh, one of the mechanisms i provided to you now mm -hmm. how did i find out about the law of, particularly the law of forgiveness in the first century is something that i spent a lot of time with mm. and and you know i had many many damaging things happen to me through my life in the first century right from my childhood onward mm. and and you know required constant uh levels of forgiveness mm. uh, that if i wanted to grow my relationship with god and and what I learned through that process is not only do they work the laws that engage these processes, but the, but because of the mechanism of conscience, God's saying that this is the way you need to proceed with mm -hmm. regard to dealing with this particular problem. You know, uh, my father frequently put me through quite a lot of violence 
uh, both externally and at his own hand mm -hmm. in the first century. You know, the Bible would like to, you know, de demonstrate that my father and my mother were kind people to me. And that wasn't the case at all, particularly with my father. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, I had a lot of violence uh, and, and a lot of quite harsh violence, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and in, in a few cases, uh, quite quite close to death in terms of the harsh violence. Mm. And so I had things to forgive. Mm. And and the process of forgiveness was an essential part of, mm. of my progress. And so, so how did we learn about it? By connecting to God through both of those mechanisms, mm -hmm. the, through the Holy Spirit, the connection with the Holy Spirit, the longing that comes from the soul, prayer, in mm. other words, mm. and the other process, which is the conscience. So mm -hmm. prayer and conscience are mm. the two ways that I learnt about these particular things and every single person can get that education directly from God. That, yeah. That's the beauty of the conscience yeah. and also the beauty of the relationship. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to have a series of videos to be told these things, mm -hmm. but for most people, we do need to have a series of videos <laughs> to be told because we are neglecting our yeah. relationship with God. We neglect our conscience. Mm -hmm. We neglect also the you know relationship with love mm -hmm. with God. Uh, for lots of different reasons. Some of them are injury-based reasons and some of them are desire-based reasons. Mm -hmm. So some are based about our will mm -hmm. and some are based on our desire. Mm -hmm. And and this is why we wanted to share this information with people because without, you know, without education, it, it sometimes is really, you know, so what we're trying to do here is give a pe person enough education that they're willing to connect to God about the issue. Yeah. Once they connect to God about the issue, then there's no need for Mary or Jesus to be involved in the process mm -hmm. because in the end, God's directly involved in the process. God can share with you what the problems are. God can share with you what you need to do about them. Mm. And and also, uh, it's going to have to require a lot of sincere desire on your part to to work your way through those issues. And and that's what God is waiting for, for, mm. for our sincere desire to work through those issues. So... You know, basically what we're trying to do here is give, give people enough inspiration mm -hmm. to be able to put into application mm -hmm. the truth about God's, the conscience, the law of conversation and the laws of forgiveness and repentance. Mm. And, um, and, why, and it doesn't really matter where they get the education from initially, as long yeah. as they get started. Yeah. Eventually, they'll get the education directly from God and, yeah. and, they won't, and they'll, they'll understand that a lot of the things that we're stating here are actually true. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, you don't know they're true and yeah. you possibly don't even believe they're true. Yeah. And so you're going to need some time and energy to think about and ponder about those things. Some logic is going to need to be presented to you. Some experiences are going to need to be presented to you. You're going to have to look at your own life in a sincere manner to see what's happened with it, mm -hmm. to see how the law of compensation is working in your life and things like that mm -hmm. before you'll probably engage the process sincerely. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. All right, well, just to quickly recap, because we're talking here about why God doesn't um, force forgiveness and repentance. There's four major things that you said. Mm -hmm. The first was that by definition, both processes must be engaged in, by the individual as an uh, expression of their personal desire. And that's something that we know God never, because God gifted free will, God never interferes with how we engage with that gift. Mm -hmm. There's laws that operate, but God never can't force that by definition. Mm -hmm. So it, they must be voluntarily engaged. The second is that they involve, as an expression of free will, gathering a sensitivity to a lot of different factors, and that must be engaged personally. God can't force us to do those things. So sensitivity to the effects of the sin that we've engaged, sensitivity to the effects upon us, so externally and internally, and sensitivity to what we were avoiding when we sinned. Um, the third reason God doesn't force it is that God has already ensured order within his universe through the operation of other laws. Mm -hmm. And the fourth one was that what you were just talking about is that it, there must be this free will engagement of a desire to be educated in these processes mm -hmm. and God can't force that upon us. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So if we examine all of those reasons, we can see quite clearly that we're never going to be forced into the process, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. Yeah. Um, and if we're going to engage the process, we're going to need to have quite a lot of sincere desire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the parable of the prodigal son, which is chapter 15 in Luke, verses 11 to 32. 
So we're going to um, discuss this Bible verse now. Um, before we do, I wanted to ask why you to explain why we've included that in this series and at this point in the series. Well, well obviously um, there are certain things that are recorded in the Bible that are very similar to what I did finish up saying. And there are, you know, there's, there's items of in interest in the Bible as a result of that. This is, this is an actual illustration that I did actually speak about. Yeah. Uh, not quite in the way that it's listed. There was a few, there's been a few changes to mm -hmm. my original statements, but it, basically this is called the parable of the prodigal son or, yeah. you know, the story of the father's love or, you know, yeah. a lot of Christians call it different things. The story of the two brothers, the lost son, yeah. the lovesick father and so yeah. forth. But basically it's a story about forgiveness and repentance. And, and I sort of made this story in such a way that would probably have, have an emotional effect on the listeners. I, I tried with most of my illustrations that I used in the first century to, to try to appeal to people's emotional injuries and their, or, or you could say the emotions that existed within them where they got passionate. You yes. Know? And, and so in this particular story, you know, the, the way that I couch the story was in such a way to try to try to help people feel passionate about wow how bad was this and how good was that type of thing in the story so 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 there's certain elements that are cultural but also yeah. um issues like family relationships where people connect quite emotionally yeah. to to this and what, what i'm going to do is read it as the bible says it uh -huh. because that's the th that's the thing that most people would be aware of yeah. and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the changes that have been made um, and why but mm -hmm. but but we're more focusing our attention here not on the you know the the so-called accuracy of the text but but more about you know the underlying uh, motivation of the text which is mm -hmm. to illustrate god's response so here we're talking about god's emotions and feelings about mm -hmm. forgiveness and repentance remember in this section mm -hmm. and here we want to illustrate god's response mm -hmm. to what happens when somebody is repentant mm -hmm. and what happens when somebody forgives and also God's response to sin. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we need to also see that uh, mm -hmm. as well as a part of the story. Mm -hmm. And all of those things are contained within the story. Mm -hmm. And so it's important, I feel, that we mention the story uh, because there is, uh, hopefully it will help people when it comes to us explaining how God feels about forgiveness. So when it, when it comes to explaining how God feels about forgiveness and how God feels about repentance, the story is quite clear about God's reactions to those particular things. And, and so we need to, you know, the illustration is a good way of showing people what God's feelings are about these things. Okay. Yeah. Reading the parable of the prodigal son, uh, Luke chapter 15, verse 11 to 32. <laughs> so could I now ask you to read that sure, verse, sure. those verses for us? So this is uh, around about what I said. <laughs> it's probably the best way to say it. A man had two sons, and the younger one said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that should come to me. So he, the father, divided his belongings between them, the sons. A few days later, the younger son gathered all of his things together and travelled to a distant country and there squandered his property by living a debauched life. When he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred throughout that country and he fell into need. He even went and attached himself to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to herd swine. And he longed to be filled with the carob pods that the swine were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread while I am dying here from hunger? I will get up and travel to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was moved with pity, and he ran and embraced him and tenderly kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. 
But the father said to his slaves, Quick, bring out a robe, the best one, and clothe him with it, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Also bring the fattened calf, slaughter it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead, but has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they started to enjoy themselves. Now his oldest son was in the field, and as he returned and got near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants to him and asked what was happening. He said to him, Your brother has come, and your father slaughtered the fattened calf because he got him back in good health. But he became angry and refused to go in. Then his father came out and began to plead with him. In reply, he said to his father, Look, these many years I have slaved for you, and never once did I disobey your orders, and yet you never once gave me a young goat to enjoy with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours arrived, who squandered your belongings with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Then he said to him, My son, you have always been with me, and all the things that are mine are yours. But we just had to celebrate and rejoice, for your brother was dead, but has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Let's summarise the parable of the prodigal son, <laughs> which is in Luke chapter 15, <laughs> verse 11 to 31. So thank you for reading that. Could you explain that parable now? Certainly. Um, firstly, I'd like probably to say some clarifying things about the parable. There's some, there's some, you know, while the parable itself is not exactly as I stated it, mm -hmm. I, I gave a lot more detail actually mm -hmm. in the parable that I stated in the first century. I, I sort of explained that what the debauched life was that the yeah. son was living in. Uh, I also explained, you know, more about the attitude that the other son had towards the father and the brother. Mm -hmm. and. I also um, stated things in such a way where it would trigger certain emotional feelings in in the people who were listening because it was highly there, there was a lot of things that I stated in the in the parable that were highly unlikely for the average person in the first century to do yeah. as a father. And we should say you didn't just tell this story once. No, it's a story like a, a story to describe a lesson that you told many times to many people. So. That's right. That's yeah. right. And, and I suppose one of the, the major changes that had been made was when the son who was the prodigal mm -hmm. asked the father to be one of, as one of his hired men, because that, that's certainly not what I said. Mm -hmm. what, what I said was it, he asked to be one of his slaves. Mm. The reason why he asked to be one of his slaves is because even the slaves of the father got treated better. Mm -hmm. than what he was now being treated working for the citizen of another country. Mm. 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 But perhaps what we need to do through is I'll step by step now go through it and just explain what, why I said some of these things that I said mm -hmm. about the story. Well, firstly, when, when the f younger son says to the father, come and give me a share of the property that should come to me, and the father then divided up his property amongst his two sons. This was highly unlikely in mm -hmm. the first century to have ever occurred. Mm -hmm. The father would normally retain his property until his death, mm -hmm. and only at his death would the sons then gain the wealth that would come from the property. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's interesting to note too, and I made it pretty clear in my first statements about the, the parable, that both sons got their inheritance immediately, mm. which meant now that the father was not any longer the owner of the property. Mm -hmm. The son got his, in, uh, the younger son got his inheritance. Both of them got equal inheritance, which is also unheard of. Usually, only the older son mm. would have got the major part of the inheritance, mm -hmm. but in this case, they both got an equal uh, share. share of the inheritance. The younger son. Got paid, it pay, got paid out basically out of the property mm -hmm. and the older son now owned the property mm -hmm. and the father was now living like a, a tenant, if mm -hmm. you like, or a, a tenant without, of course, any uh, uh, way, you know, payment, payment of yeah. rent yeah. on his son's property. So mm -hmm. the son actually owned the property now the father was living on. Mm -hmm. And the other son took the rest of the inheritance, his, his share of the inheritance, his half, 
and he went abroad and squandered it completely. And he lived, a, well, I said pur purposely that he lived a debauched life where he was always with prostitutes. And, and basically what I did was I listed a number of different actions that the son took, which were all against what was now, then known as the law of the Talmud. Mm -hmm. So this included him even eating, uh, you know, wanting to eat the food of pigs. Mm. And, and the Talmud, we should say, is the Jewish uh, uh, holy book. Well, it's the first five books of the Bible, basically. And uh, along with some, uh, you know, and the extension of it is some of the prof books of the prophets and so forth. But the governing, uh, the, the governing... The governing law was law, the Talmud. Yeah, and the governing book of the Jewish people. That's yeah. right. <laughs> so so, so uh, the Jewish people basically lived by the law contained within the first five books of mm -hmm. the Bible. And... And basically, this law stated with regard to prostitutes, of course, that that was wrong. Mm -hmm. And also uh, with regard, and in fact, uh, at the threat of death, that mm. was wrong. Uh, anybody who was a fornicator would uh, be normally under the, under the and apply, meant to have applied to men and women, of course, but mm. well, frequently didn't. But mm. um, where both if they were a man or a woman, they'd be stoned to death mm. for, for committing fornication of any kind. You mean adultery? Yeah, and yeah. For, or fornication, even in an unmarried state, you mm -hmm. know, having sex mm -hmm. in an unmarried state. Yeah. And then on top of that, uh, you know, herding pigs was one of the worst jobs you could ever do. It was considered to be lower than than uh, you know, looking after the garbage of the community. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, looking after the garbage of the community was considered to be a a, a quite responsible position, whereas. Whereas uh, herding pigs was considered to be one of the worst things you could do as a business. And then to be a hired worker herding pigs would be even worse, <laughs> of course, worse. if you were so the owner. He, he'd fallen pretty on hard times to be doing something that was classified, to be uh, interacting with animals that were thought to be so unclean. Exactly. Yeah. From, from a Jew's perspective yeah. at the time of the day, mm -hmm. at that time, he was thought to have, you know, fallen the worst yeah. uh, than anybody could fall uh, in terms of their sins. So, so far in the story, he's gotten this massive sort of gift that the law would state he wasn't entitled to. Correct. Then he, he squandered the gift. Which he, he asked for, which nobody in their right mind in the first century would ever ask their father for. Yeah. At the threat of death, in fact, yeah. in many cases, my, any father who had a son asking for his inheritance before the father's death would frequently feel that was an offence enough to kill the son, mm. actually. Mm. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes that actually did, did happen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's pretty, pretty strong to actually... Because the familial system and the father-son... It, it was, was very, thought to be a disrespect to the father. Almost tribal in, in yes. nature back then. Yes. Okay. Mm. So he got something that he didn't... Society said he didn't deserve. Yes. Then he went off and used that gift in a very sinful way. Can, can I say with the thing, getting thing he shouldn't have deserved? Yeah. See, in the law, in the Talmud, there, there, was a, there was a law that stated you must respect your parents. Yes. And this would have been seen as a disrespect of the parents. Yes. And by the way, under the law, disrespecting of parents was at the threat of death. Mm -hmm. So the father now had the right under the law to actually uh, stone his son to death. Mm. Right. So didn't kill him, but gave him what he asked for. Yeah. Exactly. Then he used the gift that he received in a very sinful manner. And he used it all, all at once, and he didn't save anything. Yes, but let's also look at the father's actions here in this first section for a bit. Okay. The fact that he gave his son the inheritance, he, wasn't, he didn't take offence yes. of, at his son. Yes. And, and in fact, he gave them both his inheritance just because one asked. Yes. So, so, so one asked, but both received the inheritance. So not only did he not take offence mm -hmm. about something that was obviously, in, in terms of uh, the Jewish law, a sin. Yes. Right. But yeah. not, of course, with God. But it, it yeah. is with the Jewish law, which was the people I was talking to. It's obviously a sin and mm -hmm. quite an extreme one because because you could have died from it. Mm -hmm. And 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 yet the father gave that without any. Uh, mention of there being a sin yeah. or, or dis disrespect or any of those things. Yeah. So he didn't take he he didn't take offence and he was very generous. Yes. 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 Okay. So then the son squanders it. He doesn't use it wisely. He uses it in a sinful fashion. Yes. And then by the time it's all gone, he's reduced to uh, employment that is considered to be the lowest 
in society, basically. But not only that, he's starving to death. Yes, he, he, so he's he, hungry. He's not getting enough uh, mm -hmm. from the employment to even eat properly. Mm -hmm. So he's willing to eat the food that the pigs eat. Yes. Right, which which obviously again is quite bad. You know, for <laughs> yeah. Jewish people to for a Jewish person to re be reduced to those circumstances. It would have been seen to be like the worst possible degradation. Absolutely. Mm. So he's fallen as low as he can go almost. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so then, then, of course, there's this period of time where the son comes to his senses mm -hmm. by saying, wow, look at what's happened to me. So the yeah. law of compensation, you could say, yes. <laughs> grinding its uh, yeah. way and showing him, you know, the choices he's made being pretty bad and mm -hmm. it's resulted in this end for him. And, and he decided that now that he could return back to his father because everything doing his father's way as a slave was better than living this way as a free man. So living as a slave to his father, he recognised was freer, was freer and better. Than, <laughs> and better than, than, than living the... as a free man, you know, in yeah. another country. Yeah. So and what I was trying to illustrate there too is a lot about doing things God's way. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people see doing things God's way as slavery almost to God, and that's not the way it is. Mm -hmm. being, doing things God's way is better than being having your own sense of freedom for yourself to do whatever you yeah. want. <laughs> and, and, and I was trying yeah. to illustrate that through this illustration as well. So already if we look at the illustration, we see there's gifts, there's incredible generosity. On the part of the father. On the part of the father, and no offence, no, like we were talking about. No rage, no earlier wrath. in this uh, discussion about um, God may not like or approve of some of the, the sinful things that we do, but there's never rage or wrath. And or, God, God could would have offence. So the father would have felt the disrespect in the son's mm -hmm. request, mm -hmm. but still didn't take offence. Yeah. And right. gave generously to enable his free will, if you like. That's right. Yeah. And and in fact, all of my listeners would get, you know, when I said something about what he went yes. to his father, you know, <laughs> that, he did that. In, usually when I gave these illustrations, um, you know, people would get involved in them over uh, time. And, and and you can imagine, if, if people imagine for themselves today, but, but back then what happened is that you'd be sharing it amongst, you know, a group of 50 or 100 people or so who could listen to you at once. And, and in then you hear people say, what, he did that? That's really bad. And, you know, they like, yeah. and you'd start uh, conversing about, you know, yeah, you know, this is his attitude to mm -hmm. his father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that was the attitude. Uh, then he, obviously his free will was enabled and he went off and he, in harmony with his will and desire, sinned a lot. Mm -hmm. And then there was a compensatory effect. Mm -hmm. So already we're seeing a lot of what we've discussed in this series playing out. Mm -hmm. And things got pretty bad. Mm -hmm. And he got life threatening. To, life -threatening mm -hmm. And he got to a point where he recognized I'm in sin. I'm in mortal danger. Mm -hmm. And maybe doing things my father's way, even in the most lowly position, in would, his household yeah. would be better than what I'm doing. That's right. So there's a, there's this opening to God's way, yeah. basically. Yeah. yeah, and you know, like I feel really emotional yeah. about that even, yeah. like because it, the way I see it is that that's often the way it is with God. We, like we would see, you know, that the, the very worst thing we can experience with God is far better than anything else we could ever experience, you yeah. know. Yeah. And of course that makes sense of being yes. God being God of love. Yeah. but. We don't see God that way frequently. Mm. So, you know, so this is why I created this illustration. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. So then what happened next? Well, the, the father's response. Uh, so w once the son met the father and the, the way I would explain it frequently in, in conversation was, you know, the father, the son going, no, I don't deserve that. I don't deserve mm. that. I, you know, just make me a slave. Just mm. make me a slave. I'll be happy to work for nothing, uh, not have nothing. You just, you know, just to cover over my head and food on my table, that's all I need type of thing is what, yeah. is what he wanted, you know. And what I did there usually was I tried to illustrate uh, in the feelings the extent of the son's uh, mm. remorse about mm. his behaviour mm. uh, because that doesn't really come out very much in the way the illustration's been written here in the Bible. Mm. But, um, but the extent of the son's remorse was such that 
He, he, he didn't even expect anything from the father. It's, it's almost like he'd gone from a very entitled state of yes. like, yes, I want all of this from you, Dad, now, to a state where he's now coming and saying... expect anything from him now. I expect nothing, but would you do me the favour? Yeah. <laughs> sort of, would you, would you even just let me come back in the lowest yeah. part Possible of your position. household? Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. right. Yeah. And that's what I was trying to illustrate, mm. is that he, he, his attitude... And, and it doesn't come out well in the way the illustration's been, you know, written, mm. but his attitude was such that he, he was in a state of full repentance now, mm. not, not, you know, he knew all the damage that he had done. And, and, he, and in fact, there's no indication in the illustration as it's written in the Bible that how the father found out about the son's debauched condition. Mm. But, but in, in my illustration, uh, the son explained what he had done with the, father. with the inheritance mm. and how he'd been living. Yeah. Yes. So then what was the father's response? What do we see there? Well, see, the father he treats the son as if he's like, almost like, you know, the, he's, he's the long lost son that he, that he, that he, that he knew he had, but, mm. but had gone and he mm. thought had gone for good. And, and so he's overjoyed yeah. uh, uh, to receive him back again. And, the fattened calf, uh, uh, as an illustration, uh, usually in Jewish time, uh, because animals, uh, you had to be a fairly wealthy person to herd, to have animals in the first place, generally, back in the day we lived anyway. And, and so the fattened calf was the calf that was going to be prepared for the next important meal. And usually that next meal was the Passover or some other religious festival. Um, and so, you know, taking that meal, taking that meal and then giving it to the son was a, was a major thing, right? It was uh, the most valuable sort of food item, isn't it? That's in right. The, in yeah. the household. And that's you, right. You, you're guarding it for a special occasion. For a special occasion. And it's being prepared for a special yeah. occasion. Instead, yeah. this occasion is even more special. Yeah. And, and in case, and what I basically illustrated in the original illustration was that the fattened calf, which was prepared for the Passover, mm -hmm was given to the son. Mm -hmm. And of course, That's for the Sadducees upper. and Pharisees, yeah. that was like a major... <laughs> like, <laughs> it's almost an offence against... <laughs> offence, you know, yeah, yeah. against the whole the Passover whole, celebration. Yeah. But um, that's how I stated it. And so, so, so by the time the, the, the you know, and, and not only that, there's this singing and the dancing and everyone's celebrating the fact that he's home and the father's encouraged all that. And of course, Remember here, of course, that the father doesn't have any property anymore. Yeah. So whose property is he using? <laughs> the other son. Yeah. He's using the other son's property to give. <laughs> to, to throw the party. To throw the party. Yeah. Which, of course, <laughs> adds to the fuel yeah. of the other son's, yes. um, you know, response. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yes, so keep going. So the father so the and the father has taken no offence, even though he knows that the son has done all these sinful things. The, he he feels that the son is sorry for what he's done. That he can see he his can sin. see his sin. The son can see his own sin. But he hasn't promised, of course, that there wouldn't be, uh, you know, peer, you know, because the father had no more property to give the son, of course. Mm -hmm. So you know, they, they could, he couldn't promise any more things to the son, and of course. Um, the, the other son would have to honour the father's desire to put him in as a, mm. uh, even as a high head or to have him in the house, right? Mm. Because the son, other son owned the property. And it was only out of respect for the father, the other son even allowed any of these things to happen. Yes. Yes. All right. So what, let's talk then. Of, we see the generosity in the father then mm. and this very big spirit of openness and love towards this son who's clearly recognising his sin now. Yes. Let's talk about the brother's response. Yes, so the brother's response is all about the illustration of forgiveness, isn't it? So, so the father's response is all about, you know, forgiveness of the son, mm -hmm. but, but the brother's response is all about forgiveness of his brother mm. not, mm. And, of, and of his father's actions, because mm. like, obviously he feels that his father's actions are mm. wrong. And, and it's interesting, the other son's response, which was very much about you know, com competition, uh, resentment. And this is where I think... For both the brother and the father. It's such a marvellous um, parable, analogy, story, because so many people can relate to 
sibling rivalry and feeling all this relationship with the parent between the children of the same parent and stuff. Yeah. But the brother really feels like he's being hard done by now. Like he feels like, and I often feel sometimes like I'd like to write the parable of the prodigal son from the perspective of the, of the first son. Because sometimes in my life, I've felt like the first son where I've done everything that I think my parent wants just because mm-hmm. I want the approval of my parent and I want to be seen to be a good person. Mm-hmm. But it's not necessarily done uh, from my heart mm-hmm. because what this shows, I think, in this parable is that the brother felt he didn't, he wasn't staying at, with the father and doing all these things because he loved it. Because if he did, he'd he'd have a very similar attitude to the father. He'd be like, I've been here doing what I love and what I want and I'm happy and I'm happy to see you back. Instead, he feels disappointed and mm. like he's he's been doing the right thing, but but he, where's his reward kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. And actually, you know, if you look at what I actually said, I said, look, these many years I have cared for you because because remember, the other son now owns the father's property. Yeah. I've cared for you and never once did I even disobey your orders, even though it's my property. Yeah. And yet you never you never prepared for me a young goat to, of yours to enjoy yeah. with my friends. Of course, he'd given all all to his son anyway, <laughs> so it was pretty hard for him to do such a thing. But as soon as his son arrives with you, you squandered my belongings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and who squandered his belongings with pros- your belongings yeah. with prostitute? You slaughtered my fattened calf for yeah. him. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. And and in that in those statements, I was trying to illustrate to people that you know frequently um, the way people see it when God forgives one of uh, one of God's children. You see, see, in some ways the other son had sinned against the, uh, the brother as yeah. well. Uh, in this, in some ways. Of course, the father hadn't because the father had distributed his his wealth Evenly. equally. Mm-hmm. But in some ways, the son, the other son had sinned against the brother too because he'd come home expecting the father to give him something, to mm-hmm. live as a slave in his father's house, mm. but it was no longer his father's house. Mm. So so there was, there was still not really the acknowledgement of the other son that... So the second son sinned against the... The, the younger son. First. Yeah, mm. was ha, ha, sin against the first was was that that he wasn't even acknowledging that now he owned all the property that was mm-hmm. left over. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so the father could rightly say to the older son who who had been with him all these years that look, everything that is mine is yours. Mm. You know, I've already given it to you; mm. it's already yours. So, but but I just had to celebrate because this. Our other son, your your brother, had come home, you know, mm. and he's been lost to us and now we've found him. Mm. And I think frequently what I see uh, happen is that people, like, and what I was trying to illustrate here, and, and there's a few other illustrations that I used to give them, that some of which are sort of distorted in the Bible a bit, but uh, about how there's often this competitive feeling that if I have done this for a longer period of time, so in, in other words, if I have done you know things god's way for a longer period of time then i should then i should get more rewards than a person who's only just done god things god's way for a day mm-hmm. and there's there is this often this feeling of i've done it longer i deserve more mm-hmm. and you've done it shorter you deserve less but see from god's perspective all we need is to engage the law and we already get what we deserve Mm. And and the person who engaged the law f- from God's perspective the longest has already received the benefits for the longest. Mm. So there's no feeling of uh, um, of inequality in this. Mm. It's just that every person, every person who comes back to God is going to get treated the same way mm. in this very accepting way, uh, no matter how long they were away <laughs> from God. So you're really saying that, so obviously the father in this story represents God. You're saying that the first son was already every day enjoying the benefits of the father's generosity. And love. And love. Mm. And now the second son has come home and what he's receiving is the father's love and generosity. So it's an equal gift. Yes. But the first son doesn't realise that. That's right. Mm. Yeah, that's right. 
Yes. And because of her son still has not gotten rid of this attitude that he's done work for longer, so therefore deserves more pay. Mm. You see, and frequently uh, I use those kind of illustrations where a, a worker comes at the beginning of the day. Another illustration I gave about this was a worker becomes at the beginning of the day, the, the owner negotiates a price. It's, it's $500, you know, let's say one drachma for the day, you know, yeah. was, a, was a payments back then. A drachma for the day, let's say, uh, which is quite a generous, generous payment, right? Mm -hmm. But let's, but but let's say, and then and then somebody came halfway through the day, and he says, "I'll give you a drachma for the rest of the day." Mm -hmm. And then someone comes right near the end, just in the last hour of the day, and he says, "I'll pay you another. I'll pay you a drachma for just one hour." Yeah. And and you know the people who are listening to that would frequently go, "Hang on a sec, that's not right. That's not fair to the first one." Yes. Not understanding though, it was an agreement between uh, between people mm -hmm. and agreements should be honored and you know, often i'd be illustrating how agreements should be honored no matter who who you know the fact whether you felt you were disadvantaged by honoring it or not right mm -hmm. but uh, but in this case it's the same kind of thing where the the far the the older brother believed that he'd done more and he'd been more kind to dad and he'd been yeah. so why didn't he get all of these extra things you know mm -hmm. of course he had the opportunity to have a party every day of the week with his dad if he wanted to. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, and he had the means to do it, um, which his father had given him, by the way. Yeah. Uh, so he, he could have easily done that if he wanted to, but, yes. but uh, he just hadn't because he, of his decision not to. Mm. Mm. So, so then um, there's a number of things I'd like to, to ask you about if, with regards to the, to the parable. Mm -hmm. um, Firstly, uh, let's just mention a few things that it displays. So one of them is that, so most people in our society, especially people in the public eye, uh, in, in Western cultures, they're honoured when they present a facade and when they lie. And mm. then when they tell the truth, often they are, you know, attacked, attacked mm. very savagely. Mm. Um, so this story shows that firstly, God doesn't, God's not like that. No. God loves our honest and sort of exposed heart. Yes. Yeah, so the the younger son exposed his true condition to his father. Yeah. Because uh, his father had no other way of knowing what that would be. Yes. And so the younger son actually did it mm -hmm. and exposed his true condition to dad, told him exactly what had been going on, mm -hmm. knowing full well that his dad would feel that all of those things were sins. Yes. Uh, and yet still the dad reacted the way he did. Mm. Mm. Which it's very beautiful. Um, I'm thinking about an earlier part of this discussion that we had, which was about how God feels about our individual choices. Mm. Um, and I think there's a lot in here about that and that demonstrates what we were talking about earlier. Mm. But I'd like to ask you about this concept of acting in duty versus acting in desire. Mm. <laughs> Because partly in our discussion when we talked about our choices, you, you brought up the fact that God loves it when we make choices. Mm. Um, and what I think about in this parable is that the first son, it always seems to me that the first son was acting out of duty, so not necessarily out of desire, because I feel his reaction demonstrates that. I don't know if that's correct, but because it resonates with some of my emotions, that's mm -hmm. how I read it. Yeah. And I used to feel angry. I used to feel like the first son, because I've, you know, I think many people feel like, I'm trying to do the right, do thing. The right thing and do it God's way. Mm -hmm. um, and I should, you know, I don't. I want this approval and love, and and I'm just going to do anything to get it. And if that means doing my duty, I will, and I will forego my personal desires. Yes, it's sort of like I'll earn your love. Yes, and I'll forego, and, and not understanding that this is not what God wants from us. Like God wants us to engage our desires. So the second son fully engaged his desire. He he went. I've got this desire. This is. I'm gonna go for it and even though it was really sinful he got to see in the, in a quicker way than the first son did the full extent of where his condition was leading him mm. and he came back in a very humble 
state, a very softened state. Yeah, you've got to be careful though, because it's not something that it's not it's not the way he could have uh, engaged his full desire, is it? No, and mm. it's not to endorse a person going, oh, I've got all this desire to sin, now I'm going to go and do it. Exactly. Um, that's not what I'm meaning to say, but the the very um, the connection with the desire that's something that each of us can do without acting on it. Yes, yeah, so well, I think what you're trying to say, though, is yeah, if I can uh, say it more succinctly, yeah. the younger son acted on his unloving desires. The older son also, in some ways, had unloving desires. Yes. His unloving desire was that he could earn God, mm -hmm. his father's love. He had an error in within him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he believed he could earn his father's love yeah. rather than act in desire for mm -hmm. his father's love. Now, now, of course, none of them, except the, son, the younger son in his repentant stage, mm -hmm. none of them actually wanted the father's love from a desire. Yeah. Right. Except for when the son, the younger son returned. Now he did want his father's love from a desire perspective. Yes. And he was willing to also only have a little bit of it. Yes. Rather than expect to have a lot. Yeah. So, so yes, there was a, it demonstrates the attitude of desire versus duty. Mm. Certainly. Mm. And the older, the older brother, certainly the way I portrayed the illustration in the first century, the older brother certainly had, you know, obviously, a sense of duty, but he also had a sense of duty that his father should follow as well. Yes. And this is frequently what happened when, when we have a sense of duty, we frequently have a codependent demand mm. upon the other person who we're being dutiful to. Yes. That they also have a sense of duty now in terms of the return. Will, will the father in this story raise two sons who had strong senses of entitlement? Obviously. The first son felt he was entitled to all this stuff from, from dad if he did things this way. Well, not, it's not then, only that. It's if you think about the illustration again, the, the younger son, not the older, came along and asked for his mm -hmm. inheritance. When, when the father said, okay, I'm going to give you the inheritance, the older son didn't go, oh, no, dad, don't give me your inheritance. Yes. Yeah. Wait until you die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He never said that, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously he, he was okay taking the inheritance as yes. much as the other son was. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but also he felt very entitled that he should be the favoured son because he was doing the dutiful thing. Exactly. Um, and that's, a, which, that's by the an way, injury as well, isn't it? Which, by the way, really was also not demonstrating respect for his dad. No. Because if he had demonstrated respect for his dad, he wouldn't have accepted the dispersion of the property in the first place. The property. And he wouldn't have felt like, I deserve more honour. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So is there but, any... But frequently when we do things out of duty, it's also because we think other people have a duty. Yes. Everyone should act out of duty. In other words, we're earning something. Mm. And this is not love. And, you know, we frequently talk about how doing things out of duty is not love. Yeah. Love, love comes from a desire in the heart. It's not done because you think you have to. It's done because you want to. Mm. So it's very, very different. Mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> okay. Well, let's move on because in our next section, we'll talk about what exactly that parable shows us about God's feelings. Mm.